Hey everyone, thanks as always for your time. The question in this video is not whether NASA's Space Launch System rocket has a future, but what that future looks like, and it's getting harder to see. NASA has called SLS its Mega Moon rocket, and the agency's Artemis programs rely on the Super Heavy Lift launch vehicle to send Orion and crew on missions to the moon. But the program is working through some big transitions, and recent developments have made future plans less clear. Congress has been committed to SLS since before it existed, and NASA is carrying out that policy, with contracts that cover different parts of the launch vehicle over different lengths of time. The SLS program is currently developing two upgrades to the vehicle at the same time as the agency looks to reduce budget and costs. SLS and the Exploration Ground System's infrastructure to launch it is about half of the overall Artemis budget from year to year right now. For as long as its human spaceflight exploration programs have been called Artemis, NASA has been looking at initiatives to reduce that cost, called affordability and or sustainability initiatives. The program was supposed to begin a transition to a commercial services model this spring, but the spring is concluding in less than a month without any word from NASA or the Deep Space Transport joint venture about how those contract negotiations are going. As I noted in a recent news update video, the only update in the last year about the transition plan came from the agency's Office of Inspector General. That and other questions make the future of the program a watch item, like other questions that surround Artemis right now. In this episode, I'm going to go through these big picture questions about the future of the rocket and where SLS is right now in 2024. It's been another quiet year for SLS news so far. The Artemis 1 launch was completed at the end of 2022, and the Artemis 2 launch is now targeting September 2025. While the agency and contractors are busy working day-to-day -day on several Artemis missions, not much has been said about that work in terms of status and updates. That creates a lot of questions when there's three years between launches and doesn't leave much else to focus on. We hear that spaceflight is hard from time to time, but we don't get much in the way of show and tell about why that is. Important work is constantly being done, not just to get to the next launch, but also to shorten the time between them. That's where my focus is, and has been for the 10 years I've been covering programs like SLS. And beginning this year, I've been covering the tea leaves and breadcrumbs that are left being reported. As we get close to the midpoint of the year, the questions about the day-to-day -day details remain but there is also a lot of interest and questions in the big picture. Here are a few of those big picture questions about SLS right now. The first set of questions is about Epoch. What is happening with Epoch? Is the Epoch transition going to happen? If so, when? Epoch stands for Exploration, Production, and Operations Contract, and it would consolidate all of the work on SLS. Right now, there are several active contracts across the elements with prime contractors for those, but NASA doesn't just manage contractor work. There's also a significant amount of civil servant development, in particular at the home center for SLS, the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. SLS by itself is a little over one-third of the most recently passed exploration budget. Congress provided up to $2.6 billion for SLS out of the overall seven and two-thirds billion for exploration. As I noted when that final fiscal year 2024 budget was passed in March, that leaves the other two-thirds of the budget to cover everything else, basically all the other Moon to Mars programs and work to establish future projects. That's why NASA wants to make SLS more affordable, to make room in the budget to do everything else in Moon to Mars. Epoch started with a request for information in October 2021. It was released to get feedback from industry on transitioning SLS to some kind of commercial launch service, where NASA and Artemis would be the anchor customer for one launch per year, and the selected provider could market the rocket to other customers above and beyond that single annual launch commitment. Epoch would cover everything SLS does not just assembly and production of the elements of the rocket, the boosters, the engines, and the stages, but the coordination and all that development work that NASA also does. 
One of the common misconceptions is that the SLS flight software was developed by Boeing. However, that has always been done by NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. That work would be one of the things that Epoch would take over, along with the other things noted in the RFI, like program management and planning, systems engineering and integration, certifying SLS vehicle configurations, and integrating the rocket with the Orion spacecraft and the Exploration Ground Systems launch site. By July of the next year, 2022, NASA announced the intent to sole source this exploration production and operations contract to a Boeing Northrop Grumman joint venture called Deep Space Transport. The formal sole source justification document was published in October 2022, and the plan at that time was for the contract to be awarded by the end of 2023, in time for the transition to be complete by the start of the production cycle for the fifth SLS vehicle. But that didn't happen. Last year, NASA leadership noted they were adjusting their acquisition strategy for EPOC and eventually a synopsis for a pre-EPOC solicitation, also sole sourced to Deep Space Transport LLC, was posted in mid-June 2023. Now, instead of handing all the program responsibilities off to DST over a six-month period or so, there would be a pre-EPOC transitional period of three years. Award of pre-EPOC was planned for early 2024. By the time the NASA OIG report was released in October, that stated the contract would start in spring of 2024. In the meantime, two years of budget caps were imposed by Congress in the middle of 2023. And when the subsequent budget was passed in March of this year, the SLS budget was adjusted downwards by NASA which resulted in layoffs and workforce reductions for Boeing. Given some of these recent changes and the possible implications, I reached out to NASA and the deep space transport representatives of Boeing and Northrop Grumman. The latter referred all questions about the status of EPOC or pre-EPOC negotiations to NASA. I am waiting to hear a response back from the agency via public affairs. The next big picture question is what is happening with the current contracts in the meantime? With at least the time frame for EPOC under question, work still continues on assembly and production of vehicles for future launches, and those are covered with the existing signed contracts. As this graphic in the EPOC Industry Day slide decks outlines, Northrop Grumman is under contract to produce the solid rocket boosters for the first nine SLS vehicles. Aerojet Rocketdyne, now an L3 Harris Technologies company, is under contract to build and supply RS-25 engines for the first 10 SLS vehicles and RL-10 engines for the first four or five vehicles. There are a lot of pieces. There's also the adapters that connect SLS and Orion elements. But the major new builds for the rocket are the two cryogenic liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen stages. As I noted in the core stage production overview video, the solid rocket boosters and the engines were developed for earlier programs, essentially before SLS existed. They are all major undertakings, but it's the two stages that Boeing is building and developing that are new. Boeing is under contract to build four core stages and one exploration upper stage currently. There are options for several more after that, and some of the raw materials and long lead items have been ordered for the fifth and sixth cores and second EUS units, but that's where things get cloudy again. That existing contract is called the Stages Production and Evolution Contract, or SPEC, and it's been around since 2019. It covers production of two core stages for the third and fourth vehicles, and nods to EPOC, with Boeing providing the EUS units for the fifth and sixth SLS vehicles. For reference, the initial core stage contract that goes back to Constellation days was modified to eventually cover production of the first two core stages and the first EUS stage. Boeing has essentially completed the second core stage, so both of those are done, and EUS development, assembly, and production are ongoing. Likewise, the third and fourth core stages are well into production. The third is about half done, and the structures for the fourth are progressing. With the timing of EPOC still a question mark, what does that mean for production and ultimately delivery of the fifth SLS vehicle? 
I asked NASA about this last year, given the uncertainty created by the change in acquisition strategy that was signaled by the announcement of pre-EPOC. That June 2023 announcement was a signal that this SLS program transition was more significant and complicated and would take more time, which is one of the reasons why I started asking questions about a year ago. At the time, the end of June 2023, via NASA Public Affairs, the agency said that production of components and systems had begun for the fifth core. However, the lead element for the build is the engine section, and we have not seen those structural elements, let alone beginning their assembly. When I asked about that at the Stages production plant in New Orleans last October, the word was that those discussions were beginning. For reference, to get a sense of trends, the welding of the engine section barrel for the third core stage started in late 2020, early 2021. The welding of the fourth core stage started in the first half of 2022, a little more than a year later. We're now over two years since then without a similar signal for the fifth core, which shows some disruption in the procurement and production trend. Given the uncertainty and how quiet it is, that concentrates attention on these questions. How is this start and stop of orders for parts going to affect the supply chain? One of the stated goals for NASA's exploration directorate is to get to an annual flight cadence for Artemis. If suppliers are getting random parts orders, is that going to translate to random delivery times? The situation with the recent cuts to SLS stages and how that plays out is also a question. 18 months ago, Boeing expanded production to the Kennedy Space Center and was talking about growing into the capacity to produce two core stages a year. In the years prior to that, they had talked about optimizing the factory at Michoud Assembly Facility for the same reason. The question now is what kind of SLS delivery rate NASA is looking for, which may hinge on what's going on with EPOC. What's interesting is that Boeing just proposed using a single SLS Block 1B vehicle to launch a Mars sample return concept of theirs. And it was also interesting that NASA was counting that as GFE, government furnished equipment, as opposed to a commercial deep space transport offering. More questions, more uncertainty. Thanks for watching. Hope you liked this video. Like the other Artemis Watch items, this will be a recurring topic with more than one episode until we have a better idea about what the future of SLS looks like. These big picture questions go along with all the questions about the details for SLS in the present and all the other Artemis questions about present work and future plans.